Moving on to the district courts now. Uh, with the ninth district court, we uh, selected it, and all of the district courts are county-wide races. Uh, these are the courts you would go to if you were involved in a crime, if you're involved in a marital uh, situation or some sort of civil dispute that is significant. Um, justice of the peace will handle some minor things, but if, but if it's a state level type issue, you're going to the district courts, as I understand it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in the ninth district court, uh, we are endorse, or proposing, recommending that the MTTP endorse Kate Shipman Ben. Um, and uh, the advantages there is that she's a passionate conservative, uh, experience as a prosecutor and defender, and that gives us some level of confidence that she would be even handed on both sides. Um, highly ranked by her peers as well. Um, and some of the concerns with Brent uh, was that uh, some pos possible prosecutorial bias, I mean, he is coming from the prosecutor's office, that's not a bad thing at all, but not necessarily what you would want to see in a judge. So that was a little bit concerning to us. Um, and some joint campaign events, once again, always with the kind of police type side of things, what you would expect from a prosecutor, that's great as a prosecutor, but not necessarily so much as a judge. Um, so uh, also, he serves on the board of Safe Harbor. Great organization, but one of the things they do is they help uh, children of sexual abuse get defense and prosecute, right? So once again, as a judge, that's a little bit of a conf conflict of interest there. So, so you know, some of these scores take more than just is he a good person? Do we really like him or anything else? It's are you right for this particular role? And I think with Grant, that was one of the things that really kind of concerned us. Maybe that's not the right role for him based on his experience and everything else. Uh, for 10th District Court, um, this was actually a reasonably close race. Uh, we have, um, uh, so, so all of these district courts, we have three of them that we're going to be discussing today. I think there's a fourth that's in the cycle but is uncontested. Um, they all essentially do more or less the same thing, except some of the courts have specialized into criminal, some in family, things like that. Um, and that's all kind of decided amongst the judges. Uh, the issue in the 410th um, is that all three of the candidates have somewhat um, light experience in some areas of the law. However, we also sat down and said, you know, these are all really sharp candidates. And they can all come to speed in what they're short on very, very quickly. So that's not really a concern, it's just something we know. Um, all three of them had some really good points, and all three had some concerns. Uh, strong, uh, Bayes, we thought, was the strongest advocate of the Constitution, uh, and is against judicial activism. Uh, Robin was uh, wants to transition to family court, and we know that there's a significant backlog of criminal cases in the county right now, and we're concerned about transitioning the court to family at this point in time. Um, and then with Myers, uh, Chuck Meyer, um, he interpreted judicial ethics code, which is a code that all the judicial candidates have to abide by. He interpreted that code to say that he could not say anything about any sort of race. So like half of our questions in the questionnaire, he had a response along the lines of declined to, to answer based on his interpretation of judicial code saying that he couldn't answer. And I respect his opinion for evenly applying his interpretation of the code, but I disagree with how he interpreted that code because now we can't even judge what he really thinks. Um, so that's why he scored so low. A lot of the questions he didn't really answer. 435th, uh, the other, the final court that we're looking at at the district level, um, two really good candidates. Um, Seiler uh, is the incumbent. He's running a very efficient court, experienced with a difficult job. Um, actually, that court was originally started out, to give you an idea of the difficult job, <laughs> that court started out as a court to hear only 
child abuse cases. That you might use different terminology, but that's the terminology I'll use. Um, I mean, I would hate that job. <laughs> that, that would just be a horrible job in my mind. But um, as a result, uh, you know, he kind of came, had a target on his back by a particular group of uh, defense attorneys and uh, ended up, he was reprimanded for some of the things that he did in that court, which quite frankly, I would have done the same thing. I would have done it a lot earlier than I think he did. But anyway, um, McGinnis uh, also is a very good candidate, generally conservative, uh, but during the interviews it gave some confusing answers. Um, and is largely running a campaign against Seidler based on the referendum. So when you start hearing this thing, that's what's going on. And when we give some more detail online, we will be giving some more detail yet online about that and, and giving each candidate kind of a, a chance to review, rebut what we're going to post um, so that we try to be as balanced as possible there. Um, the third candidate, uh, Tom Moore, um, seems to view the government as a solution. Uh, he accepts a living constitution as a standard and refers Roberts to Scalia. So those are three things that kind of jumped out at us saying, no, we don't work really want him. Um, that brings us to county attorney. Uh, right now, we're, rec or, well, we're recommending that we make no endorsement. Um, two good candidates. Uh, Lambright, who's here, uh, actually, is Camp here? It's not. Um, Lambright is here, uh, incumbent since 2012. Uh, so once again, he's he's in office. Clearly, he knows what he's doing reasonably well, uh, but he hasn't been there a really long time. So he's not like one of these old fogies that are you know, just ingrained in the system. Um, he was actually but, uh, voted best boss two years in a row. And he's very active in the community. He's not only here tonight, he shows up quite often. Um, our, our one concern was he backed down during the Joe Crowley scandal. At least some people said that. <laughs> uh, Buchamp uh, was primarily a litigating attorney. And one of his real arguments was that we should be litigating more, which I almost expect from a litigating attorney. I, I'm not sure that that's right or not, but that's what he was suggesting. Uh, he believes um, the, the county attorney should be litigating more and um, concerned about the Joe Court issue. Um, so that's that's the highlights of the race. Um, we graded them both quite high, 85 versus 81, uh, with Lambright winning just a little bit. But we're not actually making an endorsement there. There's some division with them on the group. Because um, if you remember, we, we have to have a 75% agree to endorse. So that means we have eight people on our committee, that means six have to vote to endorse. And it's not just that it has to be six to two or you know five to one, it has to be six, right? So if, if you even get one person saying, well, I'm not gonna vote at all in that race, because <laughs> they're both really good at it, then that means the one person doesn't get six votes, so. Um, moving on. Going beyond the county now. Yep. Each of them, sorry. That's my... That's my Aggie accent coming out, I think. That's it. <laughs> uh, so moving beyond the county now, we have Steve Toth. Uh, is, uh, we're recommending to endorse in uh, House District 8. Um, as you can see, we have three really good candidates running for our U.S. House District against the incumbent, Kevin Brady, who I think most people in this room would agree is not such a great candidate. Um, the tough advantages, uh, why we chose him is that one of the other two good candidates, largely he's a proven fighter. He's been in the State House, he's done the work, he probably also has the best name recognition, but the fact he's a proven fighter and shown that he will fight for conservative causes is what made that endorsement. Um, Brady's problems, I could go on and on for the next hour, but uh, one, he did not respond. He's sitting congressman refusing to respond to questions that we posed to him. That's a big problem. Um, he's also has shown he's very loyal to the Boehner type wing of the party. Um, I 
is going to now collect the Ryan wing of the party after the continuing uh, resolution scandal, but also voted for TARP and many, many continuing resolutions. And it's those continuing resolutions that force through funding for things like Planned Parenthood and everything else. So, um, you know, they, they give you a really good story about how they'll be conservative, but you see their actions in office, and it's pretty clear that it's not that conservative. Uh, we believe, we hope, that Steve Toad will stand up and fight for those conservative causes. So, that takes us to the statewide races. Um, and we'll start out with the railroad commissioner, which every time this comes up, we have to explain. It has nothing to do with railroads, right? Um, a little bit of history there. Railroads, the Railroad Commission started out regulating railroads. Thus, they called it the Railroad Commission. Over time, that scope expanded to include things that the railroads carry, things like oil and gas and other things. Um, or maybe they got the gas because the pipelines, that was similar enough and whatever. But their, their scope expanded to include these things. At the same time, the federal government came in, despite the fact that it's not enumerated power anywhere, came in and said, well, we're going to start regulating the railroads. So slowly, you saw all of the railroad activities move out of the Railroad Commission and into the federal government. And I think it was 84 or something was like the last railroad issue was taken away from the Railroad Commission. But the commission was still established in the Texas Constitution. It still had other non-railroad things, so it kept its name as Railroad Commission, even though it does nothing with railroads now, and everything is basically oil and gas and other energy type issues. So, Railroad Commissioner has nothing to do with railroads. We are endorsing, we're proposing to endorse uh, Weston Martinez. Um, there were several good candidates in this race, and this was this was a really hard one to judge. Um, you see, Weston got there, got a 90. Uh, John Graytock got an 88. And you'll see all of these scores we've shown you. Those are two really, really good scores. And even third place, Wayne Christian, got an 85, which is also a really good score. Now you'll see Wayne's name there is in red or pink. Uh, that is because he currently has suspended his campaign, apparently due to some family issue. Uh, so I, I suspect he won't get back into the race. That's purely my speculation because of how many people are in the race. And there's other good candidates there. Um, it's going to be hard for him to jump back into the race and win at this point, I would think. Um, but uh, in any case, we saw uh, Weston. He's currently a real estate commissioner, so he's already experienced in being a commissioner at that level. Um, he has oil and gas experience. He's like-minded Tea Party principles and understands um, the fracking issues. Um, and at the low end of the scale, uh, Doug Jeffrey did not respond. So we don't really know that much about him, but uh, um, he didn't respond. And there, I think we did find, well, we like, I, I don't know. I don't remember. But he did not respond. So that concludes railroad tradition. And it's only an hour into the program so far. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along, um, we have now the courts at the state level. So in Texas, we have two supremish type courts. One is called the Supreme Court. They hear civil cases, family law cases, and such. The other is the, I have to always think about this, Court of Criminal Appeals, not the criminal appeal, not the criminal court of appeals. <laughs> They're not criminals sitting on the court, it is that they decide criminal cases. Um, they both act similarly to the United States Supreme Court, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. The difference simply is one deals with cases at a criminal level, the other one deals with civil and family cases. Um, and the other big difference is we elect the judges, um, six year terms. So we actually get have some influence there and they're not there for life. Um, but, they, <laughs> but they both have uh, nine judges on them 
and periodically they come up. So we have three judges in each of those that are up for election, or three spots, I should say. Um, Texas Supreme Court, and once again, Supreme Court, that civil family law cases, uh, we are recommending that we endorse Michael Massengale. Um, you may have remembered, if you were here, he did come speak to this group before. We did not get a chance to interview. We interviewed almost all of the local candidates. Um, and the vast majority, as you saw, of the local candidates responded to our questionnaires. At the state level, we had a little bit lower success rate, um, partially because it was harder to get hold of them and, and schedule them, and then we were running out of time during Christmas and everything else. But um, we did, you know, we at least know Michael Massengale because he spoke to our group before. Um, he, did, he did answer our question, and it's clear that he believes in the limited role of courts. He is a leader in constitutional causes, he looked through his resume, and it's clear that he's God centric as well. Um, Learman did not respond, and he, uh, or sorry, she recused herself from a one particular case which related to a homosexual divorce case. Um, and, and that's not even what so much concerned us as much as she didn't give any reason for her refusal. It almost looked like she, well, well yeah, I don't really want to vote on that one. <laughs> I'll be caught one way or the other, you know. <laughs> It's like, well, okay, no, if you're elected to do your job, it's fine if you want to recuse yourself for a cause, but recusing yourself without a cause really was concerning to us. Um, so anyway, that resulted in one of the larger discrepancies between candidates of 94 to 64, and uh, endorsing, proposing to endorse Michael Mike Asimov. Place five is another uh, name that should be familiar to many of us. Once again, we didn't get to interview, but we know him well, uh, Rick Green. Uh, obviously a very strict constitutionalist, solid conservative, reliance on God. And um, the one concern that we had was he didn't really have any real judicial experience. Um, but then again, you know, the, the concept of a judge is just neutral and uh, being able to agree. So that, that, that was a concern, but it wasn't a deal killer. On the other hand, there's Paul Green. Um, Paul Green is the 12th year incumbent, uh, so not, not overly long, but his concerning responses related to the supremacy in the Constitution, uh, he kind of said, well, you know, in some cases it may be something else, but that really concerned us. And uh, he also came out in support of state licensing of things like barbers. And he thought, okay, that's kind of a big government sort of issue. So, um, we didn't give him a terrible score. I mean, that's that's still a 75. But Rick Green, such a strong conservative, we gave a 95 in our recommending the endorsement. Texas Supreme Court placed six. Uh, this is uh, Eva's or Eva, Eva or Eva? Eva. Eva. Place nine. Okay. Place nine. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> such a um, We have lots of races. Uh, so. Um, Seven-year incumbent, not terribly long, uh, extensive judicial experience, and a proven conservative. So uh, we uh, uh, recommend that we endorse her. Um, her opponent, um, mildly concerning response related to parental rights, uh, related to um, when the government can kind of overrule parental rights was, was a big issue for us. Um, but once again, a mildly concerning response, he got the 70 overall, versus Eva's 90, and uh, we recommend endorsing her. Now, moving over from Supreme Court over to the criminal, sorry, the Court of Criminal Appeals. Um, and uh, in place two, we're making no endorsement, uh, or recommending no endorsement. Uh, the incumbent is Myers. Now this is interesting. Myers is the incumbent that actually switched parties from Republican to Democrat. Uh, 20, does it show? This is like a couple of years ago. 2013, I think. Uh, he switched parties. And as a result, he is the only Democrat in statewide office right now. He is running for re-election, re but on the Democrat side where he's on the post in the primary. Uh, and the 
Republican side has a race among three people to decide who will run against him in the fall. Um, we are uh, not making a specific endorsement in this race. We know someone will eventually come up the victor. They will all probably be better than uh, uh, Myers. But uh, uh, they all received reasonably high scores. The issue here, once again, was there was some dissent among the group as to who would really be best, and no one got the full six to get our support. But Ray Wheels uh, resulted in an 85 score, and Mary Lou Peel a 77, still a very respectable score, and even Chris Oldner with 74 was, was a reasonable score. So we're reasonably happy with any of the three of those. Um, but none of them really reached it. They grabbed all of us the same way. Um, Court of Criminal Appeals, place five. Also, no recommendation. There are four candidates there. Um, three candidates within five points. And we get that many candidates that are good. We get different opinions on who should be the best. And that's what happened here. Um, all three of them are really solid constitutional conservatives. Um, uh, the complaint with Harl is he has some support, support from Democrats. Uh, this was actually pointed out by one of his opponents, which is one of our concerns with his opponent of throwing something like that out there, that I don't know that that's that relevant. Um, but uh, uh, Webster also uh, tends to support state government control of licensing, and that cost him a little bit. And then Smith, uh, has no actual presence on the web right now and doesn't even seem to be all that concerned with not having that web presence right now. So um, so all three of them seem to be good, really strong constitutional conservatives. Um, we had a hard time choosing one, clearly. Uh, now, with all of these, remember, the interviews are up online, the questionnaires are up online. We encourage you to go out and make your own decision. Because even within our own group of eight people, we couldn't come to a solid consensus on this you know, before we went with the recommendation. Um, but clearly, you know, two of the three have scores above 80, and even the third is a very reasonable score, and I'm sure some are committee scored above 80. So. Yes, we're planning to do that. It's not up there right now, but we will do it. Um, place six, uh, this is, um, we're recommending endorsement of Mike Kiesler. He is the 18-year incumbent, so he has been there a little while, uh, but it was a clear choice for us. Um, he's a proven constitutionalist, um, and he's actually the author of the Medellin um, opinion. This is the opinion that Ted Cruz fought in front of the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, related to whether um, state law should be overruled by rural courts. Because um, Medellin was this guy who, I think, raped women or something and, and uh, um, was basically put on death row. And the rural courts said, how terrible death row is. And state law says, well, no, we have the right to do that. And Medellin, or, uh, sorry, Kiesler wrote the opinion on that case saying, here in Texas, we set our laws, we're supreme, world courts don't have any rule. Um, and that was upheld thanks to Ted Cruz at the Supreme Court. Um, Davis, on the other hand, we have minimal information on. Uh, he finally launched a Facebook site on uh, December 22nd. Um, he has a four paragraph biography. That was about all the information we could find. And that's why he scored so low. So, uh, Finally, as I'm sure this will be a real shocker to you, <laughs> at the national level, uh, well, it's a statewide race, but certainly the President of the United States were recommending to endorse Ted Cruz. Um, he stands up for constitutional values, strong conservative, God-centric, highest score given to date by our organization. And that probably does not come to a surprise to any of us. Um, we all really like Ted Cruz. Um, the other noteworthy thing in this campaign is Donald Trump. Um, he's kind of always noteworthy in general. But uh, he actually scored, has probably the score that will stand for a while of the largest disparity of scores among those on the vetting committee 
ranging from a 6 to an 85. Uh, well, in, in my mind, a 0 is a, a proven, you know, someone along the lines of Hitler, Stalin, Mao. <laughs> Hillary? But Hillary has not been proven to have killed millions of people, so... <laughs> yeah, just Benghazi. Yeah. Anyway, um, so, uh, but I, I think probably what's most interesting on this slide is the actual list of candidates and the scores on the left hand side. That uh, there was reasonable consensus among us, particularly Cruz being first place, Paul being second place, and then you had kind of this whole category of, of other candidates that were quite a bit lower scored than those. So you have 96, the highest score to date. 80, and then drop down to 69, and then everyone else is kind of in that 60 range until you get down to the bottom two candidates, Bush and Kasich. Um, so, uh, that was it. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, Lynette, Raylan are handing out the uh, ballots to the members uh, tonight. We have 21 that are present, and so that if I uh, push the buttons correctly on the calculator, I believe that's 13 that it takes to approve that. It'll just take a minute to do that. Um, any, any questions that we can fill? Yes, sir. We're voting for the entire race, right? Correct. And then if I could put it right there? No. Just a yes or no check on it. John, I have a question. Yes. Can you explain how did y'all rate Harley Fiorina higher than Ben Carson and Donald Trump? Because I don't get that. It's. Um, a lot goes into it. Uh, Ken says there's different ideologies. Let me just say, I, you know, I wanted to interject a picture here with a guy hurting, with a guy hurting the pants. I wanted to see the picture of, of General Patton, two star. I know. Yeah, they called me the West. They called me the reverse of the cross. John. Push the cord in, John. Yeah, push that in. The cord. Yeah. Test it. There you go. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Jeff Ross. No, microphone. Oh, stop it. Yeah, uh, on me. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, I like Jerry Boone. That we probably ought to get used to praising the Trump. We probably don't. That's the point. One difference of the name. And Trump says I really is, you know, wild about that. But that's just the way it's going to be. Well, two months ago, all I heard was Ted Cruz was totally unelectable. Yeah. Yeah. You have 21 members here, but. How do the other members, how do they vote? You have to be president to vote. They don't vote email or anything? No. Do you have more than 21 members? Yes. 47. Dues paying members that were active, that came, you know, as we were discussing earlier, if you were here four times in the previous six months. That's right. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> So what do you guys think? Special shout out to Ken um, for doing gathering information off the PowerPoint. Um, and you're going to be amazed at the U.S. Vote Smart system. Um, we invite you guys. I had three call-ups probably in the last 24 hours saying, you know, we sent videos out, or links to videos, about a week ago. I don't know that they were all turned on. 
I think most of them are. He said, hey, I just watched the video. I like the comment. So we're going to give you that opportunity to send in, if you like, a written rebuttal uh, to, a, to a video uh, that you saw or points on there um, that we think that people need to be aware of. So, I'm sorry, the candidates. Yes, written rebuttal. Anybody else? This organization has 47 members. Well, and, and we want to try to get all the information out there for the voters that we can. I mean, there's misstatements, you know, in the videos, and, you know, if we need to point those out, let's point them out. Uh, but they have to be fact-based. You know, uh, in some cases, we want to see documents, um, especially if there's a, a real special allegation against somebody, um, just like we have in the past. We want a document, or we want a verifiable link that we can link into uh, to provide, you know, in the system. I, I hadn't really seen anybody else that does this. I think it's, you know, as Larry said, probably the most thorough process. Um, certainly transparent uh, in the area, if not the state, because we haven't heard, and we've looked around, we haven't heard that anybody else does anything like this. So, um, you see all these little icons up here? I don't know what they mean. I know what the left one means, but... Advertise. 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 Right. Uh, everybody know what next door is? Raise your hand if you know what next door is. That's, that's an unbelievable tool. Just Google it. Um, and maybe we need to put something on our website on how somebody can find their own next door. It's a neighborhood online deal that you sign up to, and you can post a link. Actually, we'll be sending out a press release, and you can post that press release on there uh, with the link to U.S. Vote Smart. I think just in my neighborhood along my precinct that I'm going to be running for precinct chair. It's like, well, there's others that are tied to it. I think it's you know, a couple of free precincts, but there's like 1,600 uh, people that have access to that. That's huge. You know, and that saves a lot of mailing costs from that perspective. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, so the final results are that uh, 17 voted in the affirmative and four voted against. Only 13 were noted, uh, 13 were needed, so the recommendation passes. So thank you all very much, and we appreciate you coming tonight, and best of luck to the candidates. We know it's gonna be a busy couple months behind, uh, ahead, um, and hopefully that you'll get behind your candidate of choice, whether they're on here or not, and work diligently through that. So again, thanks for coming out. Appreciate your time.